So <laughs> welcome everyone to Language and Learning by Jeff Buck and to this episode of Language Learning Around the World. This is interview number 18, and I'm really excited about today's special guest, Muhammad Abul Ila from Egypt. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. So we have a wonderful guest from Cairo, Egypt, Muhammad Abul Ila, also known as Mo. He has a PhD in Applied Linguistics in TESOL with a focus on curriculum and instruction. And the topic of his thesis was data-driven learning. He's a university lecturer of English for academic purposes, and his areas of expertise include English for academic purposes, English for specific purposes, task-based learning, L2 writing, cognitive and corpus linguistics, learner autonomy, and more. In 2019, he received a Fulbright grant to do research at the University of Maryland. He's an active conference presenter, and his hobbies include jogging, poetry, and chess. So welcome, Mo. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us and to come on the show. Thank you so much, Jeff, for having me. And thank you so much for uh, that introduction. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to chat with you about ELT and, you know, uh, whatever will go with that. Great. So, so what, can, what can you tell us about yourself? Who, who is Mo? All right. So um, what I can say is that um, I am a passionate um, language teacher. Uh, I've been teaching English um, for more than 10 years now. Uh, I, I, I know I don't look that old, but really I've been teaching for a long time and I, I really enjoy it. Um, I think of myself not as uh, just a language teacher, but also as a lifelong learner. I feel like I'm not just teaching my students like something, I am learning with them on the way. And so, um, yeah, as, as you said, um, I work as a lecturer of English for academic purposes. Uh, currently, um, I am an EAP lecturer um, at Coventry University hosted by um, the Knowledge Hub Universities in Egypt. So Coventry is a high ranked university in the UK. And again, uh, Egypt, the, the Knowledge Hub is hosting the international branch in um, the new capital in Cairo. Uh, but also, um, I think of myself as um, also a language researcher. I like, you know, um, to do research in, in terms of like how um, second language acquisition field is evolving. Um, I'm also interested in doing, re in doing action research with my students. Um, you know, action research uh, mainly tackles things that pop out in, in the classroom. And so I really, I'm really passionate about doing such action research, especially nowadays in, in times of artificial intelligence and chat GPT, right. but I'm sure this will come uh, all the way like during our conversation. Great. Yeah. And yeah, we can talk about those things in more detail later, but tell us why you decided to become an English professor. Well, um, good question. Uh, to be honest with you, like it happened by mistake. <laughs> I, I never intended to be an English uh, language instructor or an English professor uh, in, in that case. Um, it's, it's about like, I started to feel like a teacher uh, three years after graduating college. And I got a bachelor's degree in English language teaching. Um, and so what happens is when I started teaching, um, I started to teach kids. And at some point I felt like maybe this wasn't meant for me, you know what I mean? But then I met like back, back during that time I was doing my master's uh, it was during that time that I actually started to take my MA courses, the, the, the pre-master's courses. And I met like my MA and PhD supervisor. 
And she ignited that passion about teaching because she was really, she's, I mean, she's really a good teacher. And uh, she taught about us about like, uh, you know, different teaching methods and she was using that KWL chart. So this is like, like, I felt like, oh my God, I'm gonna give it a second try. And so I felt like I started to better understand how to be a better teacher, I believe. So it happened by mistake. But again, after some time, I started to be very passionate about it. I started to think about my students and how to facilitate their learning. And I started to feel like, you know, like I, I was cut for that. And I, I really wanted to continue doing it for the rest of my life. And that's why I started doing, like after I finished my master's, I worked toward, uh, toward obtaining my PhD. So yeah, but uh, you know, it was, you know, um, serendipitous. I landed on this job, yeah, by luck. No, that's, that's a great story. Some of the best things in life happen by accident. Yeah, so by chance. What can you tell us about your own language learning journey? Yeah, so um, when it comes to my journey, uh, the funny thing is like, what I remember like um, from those early days uh, when I started school, um, I remember that the teacher would teach us like, you know, pronouns and give us vocabulary to memorize. But sometimes we didn't even like know what, uh, such words like you know meant or anything but we had to memorize them and he would the, the teacher would dictate these words to us so later i learned that that method was grammar translation method because you know it felt like everybody had a dictionary and we started like we started to memorize words in the dictionary and that was the only way through which we learned the language but again that wasn't communicative at all. But the funny thing is like, I remember my friends and I, we used to, we, we started to kind of devise this method to speak in English using phrases. So we'd, we'd like try to put words together to make sense. Uh, and again, it was, it was really difficult for us because uh, there was no context at all. But then uh, toward high school, um, I started to get exposed to, you know, uh, many books and, and stories. And I, uh, I really liked reading. But um, when I was a kid, I read a lot in Arabic. I read like many books in Arabic. And I, like my reading speed was really, really good. I could finish like a book or two, um, um during like one day or one wow. sitting you know so it was it was it was really good and i started at the beginning like i would read like translated books okay. right but then you know after a while once i i had enough vocabulary i started to read like uh some like you know are you you're familiar with graded readers right and and these are books that have a specific number of or percentage of like signs telling you these are suitable to a specific age so right. i started reading these and um and then i i would read a lot watch a lot of movies so you can say that my um language learning journey was mainly informal okay and 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 hence comes the distinction between you know um uh, school school English and real life English, because not ne not necessarily the the two things are consistent. If you know what I mean, right? So yeah, but it was um, I I took off on my own. I started to, as I said, read a lot, watch uh, a lot of movies, podcasts, you know, YouTube videos, you name it, everything, and I believe it worked out. And what impact has that had on your teaching, your university classes and your learners, that experience? 
Yeah, that's 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 an interesting question. So when I when I think back about my English language learning journey, uh, I always reflect on that, and I feel like you know, as a teacher, my job is mainly to provide opportunities for my students to use the language communicatively. You know, right. of course, we wanna we wanna teach them the target language want to teach them vocabulary and grammar and everything but unless we try to contextualize uh such target language it will be in vain right because and and, and hence comes the idea that uh you know my my teaching philosophy uh goes around this idea which is uh communication we learn the language for um you know uh communicative purposes and, and it depends, and these communicative purposes can be specific, like, for example, uh, English for academic purposes, uh, or could be vocational, like English for pilots, for example, you know. So that level of specificity will vary from one context to another. But again, we need to provide such communicative opportunities for our students, you know, to use the language, to express the language. And, and sometimes, um, you know, like the funny thing is like the idea of using the language communicatively relates to um, a very important idea, learners' errors. Right. And, and I remember like, you know, I had a specific attitude when I started my career as a teacher about learners' errors. Right. Like I feel like, oh my God, I need to reduce these. <laughs> I need to stop my, like, I thought about my learners at the very beginning of my career as robots. They're not <laughs> supposed to make mistakes. You know, I need, right. I need them to perfect it. And, and it turns out nowadays, I feel like, you know, make all the mistakes you want. Right. I am, I am condoning their mistakes. In fact, nowadays, I am encouraging them to make mistakes. And right. so, you know, back in the day when I started teaching, I thought about mistakes as something to get rid of, to erase, to stop students from doing. That's right. why if a student was talking about something and he or she may, like makes a specific mistake, a grammar mistake, for example, right. I would stop them right. at the very beginning. But now I feel like, okay, keep going. Right. I would take some notes and maybe later on right. we do some like, you know, awareness, awareness raising activity. But again, as a teacher, uh, how you feel about errors and mistakes in the classroom, uh, it's kind of the, the understanding of such errors and mistakes is kind of evolving. Right. So as I said, nowadays, um, I am more forgiving. And I like I like when I see mistakes. Yeah, it means that the students are trying, are putting effort, are learning. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. That's a good attitude and approach. I mean, we 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 make mistakes in our L one, so we can we can't expect not to in our in our L twos or threes or whatever. And my attitude in terms of my Spanish is. Um, it's not that I don't care, but in a sense, I, I don't care if I make mistakes because sometimes I make mistakes and I know it's a mistake as soon as I make it. Um, and sometimes people correct me and and I just know <laughs> the more I, I use my Spanish, the, the, the better it's gonna get. Um, so what can you tell us about your ELT training, especially your PhD? Yeah, interesting. So um, one one thing about my master's and my PhD is that uh, both of them evolved from some action research in the classroom. Okay. Right. So um, I did my master's uh, between um, 2015 and 2018. And I found that um, many of my students had problems, you know, speaking. They weren't like interested in speaking or talking at all. And during the time I was teaching foundation year students or freshmen, 
and they were hesitant to speak. So during the time I came across uh, digital storytelling, which okay. is basically, you know, the traditional art of storytelling, but again, it's um, kind of augmented through the use of technology and, you know, and like audio, video, um, all, uh, so all this technology would enhance the quality of the story. And so I, I thought maybe I can use digital storytelling to enhance my universities, like my, my freshman uh, students' um, productive skills, speaking skills. And I would like, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna personalize the topics for them. So why don't, and some of them would, you know, commute for uh, a long distance to come to university. So sometimes they had to stay on campus and, you know, sometimes it was challenging for them to get food or they had to cook. And I would ask them to tell stories about such things, about, for example, one of them, uh, and I actually uploaded these on YouTube, but one of them told the story about you know, uh, a day in uh, in a university student's life. Okay. During that time. And I found like they could speak and they enjoyed the process. And again, uh, the, the thing that you mentioned about your experience learning Spanish, it's completely different here in Egypt because there is some sort of a stigma connected with speaking in English and making mistakes. Right. Most students are worried that they're going to make mistakes. Okay. So the anxiety is, the level of an anxiety is so high, right? And they just, they're, they're shut down, you know, they're okay. silent, they don't want to talk. But in fact, when, when it was about their daily lives and, uh, commuting to universities, university, for example, for um, uh, three or four or five kilometers, um, riding a bike all the way, et cetera, they liked the idea and they started to speak and they started to find like, you know, uh, more advanced vocabulary. So they were interested in learning vocabulary about such topics and they were more involved in the process. Okay. So, Likewise, with my PhD, so my PhD was about applied corpus linguistics. And again, um, it kind of evolved from some action research. So during that time, I was teaching um, a group of um, science and engineering seniors um, uh, how to write grant proposals. And they had many, you know, language problems, not using academic language, et cetera. So I came across the idea of corpus linguistics and corpus and, and how like corpus linguists analyze the language um, using uh, like in, in, in large language databases or corpora. So a corpus is singular, corpora is plural. And I thought, you know, this could be helpful to my students in terms of word choice, for example. So uh, I started to read in the literature about that. And uh, it had like the term for using corpus techniques and tools in the classroom um, is known as data-driven learning or DDL. So the idea behind it is like, you know, students are spies. So they spy on language, try to find linguistic patterns. And what I did is like, I used academic corpora uh, for my students using tools like AntConc, which is called a, which is a concordancer. So this is how they can access the corpus itself. And they would like, instead of, for example, speaking of mistakes, instead of telling them this word is wrong and then correct it for them. Now, what I would do is like, uh, I underline such words and I give them like the rationale about how to conduct a corpus query 
to find a better alternative, for example, to find a better adjective collocate. You know, it, it goes this way. But again, uh, interestingly, uh, it was a very time consuming process and not not all of my students like like the idea, you know. <laughs> so most of them did, but a few of them did not. And those few like found learners dictionaries where you can find like, you know, the collocates listed. So it's like this this was the indirect way of integrating corpus linguistics in the uh, EAP uh, academic writing classroom. And it worked very well. So that was, uh, you know, to sum it up, both my MA and PhD um, were kind of evolving action researches. And uh, interestingly, I presented, uh, I, I actually, I submitted an abstract after I defended my, my PhD dissertation to, um, the um, language and corpora, uh, language teaching and corpora international conference, and it was accepted. Great. Yeah. So that's 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 a good approach, but again, it doesn't really appeal to all students. And this brings me to the idea of understanding learning styles, understanding how students like you know, understanding their perspectives, what appeals to them what may not appeal to them. So we have to, you know, keep that in mind when we, um, when we teach anything. Perfect, and let's go into a little bit more depth um, in some of your areas of expertise and interest. So I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna pick chat GPT. So, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's really crazy, chat GPT. I guess it, it had, um, I guess like uh, it's first one million users wow. in, in less than one week. Um, again, <laughs> we we can look up such information. We can check it out. Um, but I've heard that, and oh. and the thing about Chat GPT, it belongs to something called generative AI. So generative AI or generative artificial intelligence uh, talks about algorithms that can be used to generate content. This mm -hmm. content could be, in, in the case of chat GPT, for example, it could be text. Right. Uh, but it could be uh, images, for example, like DALI, or you know, it could be um, a code, or it could be sometimes a video, you know, you name it. And I feel like generative AI will revolutionize uh, the English language teaching field for ELT. And because not only in terms of, because, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when when you hear about chat GPT is that students are going to use it to cheat. Right. <laughs> yeah. You just you just give, give chat GPT a prompt uh, <laughs> asking it, for example, write an essay for me. And uh, and the thing about it is like uh, students, like when when chat GPT um, became popular, some of the students did use it to uh, to cheat, you know, um, to the fact that even some academics started to talk about the death of academic essay. And right. we need to think about alternative ways to assess learners and and the re but this is not the reason why I believe Chat GPT and its siblings, uh, you know, are going to revolutionize the, um, you know, the, the 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 field of language teaching. The reason why I feel so is that it will, in uh, on on the other hand, it will provide opportunities for both, you know, uh, teachers and learners. So, for example, uh, maybe, um, maybe for example, not not necessarily cheating, but maybe a student would provide his or her essay to Chat GPT, and again, Chat GPT will personalize the feedback. Right. Right. So we need to think about 
some ways to integrate these, to integrate, I'm gonna focus on chat GPT, how we can integrate it in, in our teaching practices and, and also our students learning. But right. we're talking about, uh, you know, ethical use right. of generative AI and chat GPT. But most importantly, we're gonna encounter some, uh, you know, some concerns like about privacy, for example. <laughs> How do we make sure that our students like data is still private, Okay. right? Um, so we, we need to be concerned about that. We need to make sure we have those measures, right? Uh, put in effect to avoid exposing like data about our learners. So when it comes, when it comes, I, I want to give an example, if I may, about how to integrate chat GPT. Okay. In, um, you know, uh, uh, EFL teachers professional development in Egypt, for example. Right. So uh, as you said, one of the uh, one of the topics, one of the things I'm really uh, into is task based language teaching. Right. So how how to change, you know, your any lesson into uh, a task based uh, a TBLT lesson. Right. So the thing is, you know, if you have a specific topic, if you have uh, some if if for example uh, you have some ideas about what you aim to achieve and then maybe you ask chat gpt first of all you need to give chat gpt a role right you're my teaching assistant for example okay and then you <laughs> yourself i am teacher you know so and so, <laughs> and so and then you're my assistant okay i have some ideas about a lesson i want to deliver and then you give some context like right. for example, age of learners, uh, their language proficiency, etc. You, you give it right. some details and some some specific details, and then I want to modify this lesson into a TBLT lesson. Right. And then you will see like the product, and you know, the mesmerizing thing about it is that it's going to take less than two minutes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then and then maybe you can ask it to modify something. So you know, you know what, Jeff? Like in Egypt, the context of EFL or English as a foreign language teaching and right. learning, you'd find like till now in the 21st century, you still find some teachers going to the classroom and telling students, today I'm going to explain. The present perfect tense <laughs> and this is just you know this is like this is like a grammar based lesson right it's not communicative you know, at, at all and and so the thing about chat gpt is as i as i said i gave you an example about how a student can use it uh to provide him or her with a customized, personalized feedback on a right. piece of work. So I think about chat GPT not as a means to, to cheat, right. but as a thought partner. Right. So by a thought partner, I mean chat GPT can help you analyze something. Maybe right. chat GPT can help you, can help give you an outline of right. a PowerPoint. But don't ask ChatGPT to generate the PowerPoint for you, you know? Yeah. I, I think instead of like trying to, you know, catch a thief, <laughs> uh, it's like, yeah, instead of catching a thief and, you know, uh, investing in, in those tools and software that detect AI generated text, you know, we need to kind of have a specific um, generative AI use policy. Right. So we need we need to teach our students how to use it. You know, right. we give them a specific policy. So for example, uh, last year, um, I was teaching like uh, I was teaching my students um, a course, uh, an academic writing course. Okay. And the assignment at the end of that course 
was writing an essay. Uh, you know, right. a problem solution essay. And like many of the students would use chat GPT, right? Okay. And they had accounts on uh, on the, the website, OpenAI. And uh, the funny thing is like Turnitin uh, at that time wasn't able to detect AI generated content. So what did but you do? When you, yeah, when you get when when you get a similarity of uh one percent or a zero percent <laughs> on turn it in, you start to have like doubt, you know. Right. You become suspicious about how come. And and so I uh, I what I did is like I would ask them to give oral presentations about you know their essays. And and <laughs> some of them started to panic. Like uh, <laughs> and I said, you guys, you need to put effort in that. Uh, and and I actually I agreed with them. Let's try to think about how to use Chat GPT. Right. So I said, uh, and and then I created a list of activities for them. I even like you know because you you want to make it fair to those who didn't have access to Chat GPT. So I gave all my like I gave like the like all my students, I gave them access to ChatGPT. I created an account for them on ChatGPT. And I said, here are the things you're allowed to use, uh, okay. to use ChatGPT for. You can check, you know, the quality of your thesis statement. You can check like how strong or weak your arguments are, etc. But I'll find out if, <laughs> To actually use chat GPT to write the whole essay. Right. And you're gonna fail the course. And you will be surprised. They started <laughs> to think ethically, uh, because you know, at that time there was like a software program that can actually detect AI generated text. So I I I used this one, I showed them like in front of the whole class how I'm gonna use it, and it could really detect AI generated text. And and the students kind of lost it. <laughs> Some of them became frustrated because they didn't want to put like the effort into the process. But most of them were excited and, and they could think about how right. to use ChatGPT to their advantage, right? So it's like, you know, when it comes to using generative AI tools, we have two options here, either like, ignore and block it or embrace it right and you know i like to embrace it because uh generative ai tools are here to stay right so how exactly. how we can we need to think about how we can leverage generative ai into our own practices you know the, it it really does great thing uh it does great things and um, a couple of days ago, I finished a course about how, you know, teachers and educators in general can use chat GPT and other generative AI tools. And probably we're heading toward, you know, chat GPT is based on a large language model, right? right? Or, or a chat bot, basically. But it's conversational and natural language processing you know, techniques, and, and of course, machine learning. But we, we're heading toward like, you know, specific language model that can serve, uh, for example, you know, um, a specific purpose for educators. Okay. So we're talking about specialized language models that can educators use, for example, to avoid hallucinations, you know, um, or sometimes like, fake citations. You know, sometimes like one of my students submitted an essay and I went to check the list of references and I, I couldn't find any. And this is like how I knew he used chat GPT because, because one thing, and, and I need to mention this, this is really important. One thing when you interact with chat GPT, sometimes, it doesn't, it never, it never says, I don't know, <laughs> right? 
right. it has to come to come up with an answer. <laughs> and yeah, honestly, and and what happens is if it doesn't have an answer, it will fake one. Right. So again, we we and, and here comes the value of teaching our students things like critical thinking, right? Right. You need to think critically about uh, you know what chat GPT generates. Does it make sense? Uh, right. Is the argumentation clear, etc.? And I, I think it will be uh, students get excited when they try to find you know mistakes in you know in 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 a paper written by chat GPT. You know, they will be more interested to find you know. Um, fallacious reasoning, for example, or fallacies, so right, or maybe um, uh, the idea of having evidence and conclusion based on that evidence. Uh, so again, there are different ways to integrate chat GPT in in our practices, and it's yeah. as I said, it it meant it's meant to be a thought partner. Right. rather than a replacement to the teacher. Yeah, and I think you handled that right. And you're, you're right, it's here to stay, so we have to learn to manage it. Um, you mentioned one of your courses. Can you talk about your IELTS program and your academic writing course? I think yeah, you might absolutely. have some, some, uh, some uh, documents to, to share. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen with you now. So I, uh, first, I, I want to talk about this course okay. that um, I have developed for young and novice researchers, um, which is called Academic Writing for Researchers. And, and again, um, the, the reason why I developed such a course is that you can actually think about the uh, research process um, in terms of three stages. Uh, development, implementation, and uh, critical write and 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 the writing itself, and and so the the researchers would start with developing the research design, implementing that design, and finally writing the research report. And the focus of um, this course is on this third stage. Excuse me writing the research report. And right. in terms of what language to use, um, the sections of a research report, whether it's um, you know a thesis, a dissertation, uh, or a research paper, and how to structure an empirical research um, in terms of the introduction, the literature review, the method, results, uh, and discussion, how to write uh, an abstract, uh, how to um, format the references, uh, how to include the appendices, uh, what to cover and what to include in each of the sections of the paper. You know, again, it depends on the purpose. So uh, it's kind of uh, how to structure um, a fully fledged research report. And, mm -hmm. and that's the goal. So sometimes you might you might be asking like, but why do I focus on this stage? Right. Because I believe, especially for uh, researchers um, who are not native speakers of English language, uh, most of the time they find it challenging to right. express the you know ideas uh, in in English. Right. And so what I'm doing is uh, trying to facilitate this process okay. and. Uh, in terms of, for example, what information to include in each section of uh, the research report and what purpose each section serves. So um, that's that's the focus of this course. And um, again, uh, the most important thing as well is uh, how young researchers and you know non-native speakers uh, can use generative AI tools to their advantage okay right so there are many AI 
uh, software programs that can help them, you know, um, in terms of uh, writing their manuscripts and increasing their chances of, you know, um, getting published. Because right. sometimes you have a fantastic idea, but you're not you're not really able to put it on paper. And I believe it was Einstein who said, um, "Credit goes not to the person who first thought about the idea, right. but to the person who first wrote it." You know, okay. and again, that's the aim of uh, that's the aim of this um, course. But I, I also want to share with you. It's um, a very well organized course. So if you can see here, I have the course description. I have uh, the target audience of this course. And again, uh, dividing the lectures in terms of starting with what do we mean by academic writing style? And what are the common errors in publication? So we try to avoid these, but then we focus also on errors in each section of the paper. So uh, the introduction, like what errors like commonly occur by uh, young and novice researchers in the section of the introduction. Um, That's and yeah, great. yeah, we keep going and until we have an exit exam, and then we also uh, provide participants with um, certificates of, of completing the course. Yeah, and you can provide me with any links you have uh, regarding your courses that I can post them below the video for anyone who's interested. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, so Dr. Abu Ala, what can you tell us about um, the, the need for English in Egypt and how that affects your students and their motivation? Uh, um, I, I think in Egypt, like nowadays, everybody needs to speak the language. Everybody needs to learn English. I think everybody's doing it, you know. And when you think about the Egyptian context, uh, you might think that English is a foreign language, but I feel like English is becoming more of a second language. You'd find, you know, um, like you know an abundance of language centers where like uh you know um many many people uh, different ages go to learn the language go to learn english um you would find like an increasing a growing number of language schools so the thing about it is that uh, the medium of instruction is becoming more and more English rather than Arabic, for example. So you'd find um, many international schools, uh, language schools, semi-international schools, again, different curriculums, and I'm talking about K to 12, right? So again, uh, it feels like um, kids start learning English from like pre-K in nursery, and again, uh, this occurs to uh, like most Egyptian kids. Uh, but of course, we're talking about uh, specific socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, uh, like me middle class, the middle class and the high class. Um, they like to invest in, in their kids going to such schools. So that's, that's the scene. Everybody really want to improve their language proficiency. Because, you know, um, having a high uh, proficiency uh, in, in English specifically would guarantee that you will get a better job, uh, you will get a better income, so um, you're likely to work in an um, international or multinational company, for example. So there is that need. And definitely, all people, all Egyptians are really interested in in learning the language. But um, and and as I said, 
English is now the medium of instruction in almost like, you know, like I would say like almost all universities, all Egyptian universities. So the thing, um, the thing about learning English is that it's about, you know, we, we do have some problem relating to uh, professional development for teachers. Okay. And, and this is really problematic. You would assume that all English teachers graduate with a bachelor's in English language teaching. But the truth is uh, not many of them have a license to okay. teach English. It turns out the reason why they, um, you know, they feel like they want to be English teachers is that they can speak the language very well. Right. Right. And so they feel like they don't need to learn anything about teaching methods, for example. I mean, some of them, not the majority. Right. But, but this is really problematic. And because of the need for English instructors in Egypt, uh, many people try to shift career. You now they shift their career to be English teachers. So okay. I, I personally, I personally find this problematic because, you know, teaching must have some sort of a philosophy at the background. Definitely. And to be to be a good teacher is to be well acquainted and well oriented with, you know the um, up-to-date teaching methods and and at least have the passion to learn, you know, and have the desire to learn. But I right. find that not many people like are, are really into um, this idea of CPD or continuing professional development, right. if you know what I mean. Right. But again, uh, Egypt is um, attracting uh, many expats to come to Egypt and you know teach English, so it's uh, really a great place for expats to uh, come and not gonna say settle, but stay for a while and you know um, enjoy the Egyptian cuisine and everything. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, that's good. I only have a few more questions, but I, I want to follow up on what you said about English being the medium of instruction. Um, for general courses in in Egypt, is there any pushback against that? Is there criticism, or is it just widely accepted? Well, I I, I think there is there is a push for all teachers to speak in English. Okay. You know? Like, for example, if you are in a language school, and then you started to speak Arabic, and and of course you are an English teacher, right? right. So if if you start to speak in Arabic, uh, you might get some complaints your way from parents, you know, and 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 so that would be that would be problematic. But I've 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 never seen a parent who's kind of um, anxious or unhappy that his or her kid is you know is um, uh, like. Uh, is being taught in English, you know? Okay. So again, that's that's the, the common sense nowadays. Of course, you'd find like uh, people are really concerned about learning Arabic and are concerned about teaching Arabic. And, but nobody's concerned that English is becoming the medium of instruction, if you know what I mean. Okay. It's, it's actually encouraged. And, and again, sometimes, because we're talking about the private sector, in um, in those language schools, they would prefer somebody who has a high proficiency level in English uh, without any teaching qualifications than somebody whose pronunciation, for example, is problematic. You know, mm. so it's 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 about if you speak English really well, now you know, come and teach with us. So it's it's. It's the idea that many, many of these schools 
do not actually conduct any background check, <laughs> you know, about okay. how qualified, um, you know, uh, a person is to teach English. And I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, the English language teaching. Right. Okay. Yeah, but, but there is no pushback against that. Okay. It's, it's, actually, it's actually encouraged. Okay. And can you briefly do a contrastive analysis of Arabic versus English and um, how any differences, the differences that exist between those languages affect uh, native Arabic speakers learning English and foreigners learning Arabic? Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about it, Arabic and English like belong to different language families. Right. And um, they have distinct grammar, vocabulary, and phonological structures. And writing. Um, and yeah, yeah, and of course different writing. Yeah. So you write, as you know, you write English from left to right, you write Arabic from right to left. Um, and, and again, Arabic speakers who learn English, they may encounter challenges like related to word order. So to give you a simple example, uh, in English, we say a good boy. Okay. In, in Arabic, it's the other way around, you know? So boy is first and then good. Okay. So we say walad jayid, uh, for example. Uh, so the word order is different, verb tenses, um, pronunciation, like when you think about the, 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 etc. In, in, in contrastive studies, they help us find uh, what challenges uh, speakers of a specific language might encounter when they, when, when they start learning uh, another language like between Arabic and English. Um, so what teachers can do, they can actually offer targeted exercises and explanations to address these challenges. Um, on the other hand, foreigners learning Arabic, they may encounter difficulties with the complex script and intricate grammar. So um, maybe um, we call it, we call it tafl, teaching Arabic as a foreign language. So, okay. uh, you know, TAFL teachers can actually provide clear explanations and, and scaffold learning to help overcome these challenges. Okay. Um, but again, there is like some interaction between Arabic and English. So um, you might know that Arabic has contributed many words to English. For right. example, algebra, coffee, um, and, and zero, as you know. Yeah. Right. Perfect. And my final question is, do you have any final tips for learners or teachers? Or any final comments? Yeah. So um, I have a final tip for uh, English language teachers. And that is keep learning. You know, um, so what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Um, what I mean is like, I am a um, strong believer in CPD, which is continuing professional development. And uh, as you mentioned, I, I have a PhD in, in applied linguistics in diesel, but I feel like I am strong. I have just started learning, you know, and I feel like I just got the PhD out of the way. I feel <laughs> like I am kind of embarking on a, a new journey to learn more and to, you know, advance my teaching career and to, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I've just finished a course about integrating uh, generative AI, um, you know, uh, in, in teaching and learning. So the point here is like um, CPD is the key word. I, if I, you want to stay at top of your game, you know, uh, keep learning, keep learning about new methods and techniques. Because sometimes like, you know, um, 
knowledge is becoming obsolete really fast and, and rapidly. And so um, new methods and new, new teaching techniques are at your disposal if you expose yourself to them, uh, especially like, you know, um, um, tech ed, this is very important. And uh, mark my words, um, artificial intelligence is going to revolutionize the um, ELT uh, and, you know, and teachers profession, right? I, I, I feel like in a good way. Right. The last tip I want to give learners is that, you know, it's fascinating that you're actually speaking a language that's right. not your mother tongue. You right. should be proud. Definitely. You, know, you know, get the stigma out of the way. Right. Get the shame out of the way. Feel free to make mistakes and, and be proud that you're learning a different language. You're becoming bilingual, you know. Right. So uh, that's, that's actually uh, the most important tip. If you are a language learner, you know, be open to making mistakes. I agree. Those are natural. Yeah. So thank you, Mohammed, for taking the time to share your expertise and experience and experiences with us. If you provide me with some links, I can provide them below. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. I'm Jeff Buck. Good luck. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much Great day. for having me. Bye-bye. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. And again, such a great thing to do. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank you.